Hello and welcome to my channel. I am Daisy, your hostess. This book that I'm bringing to the channel here is titled The Secret of Brain Energy, Scientific Methods in Using Your Powers for Personal and Financial Success by Dr. Frank Channing Haddock. He was born in Watertown, New York and graduated from Lawrence College, Appleton, Wisconsin. He undertook training for the Methodist Ministries and then later on he also uh, pursued his career in law and established himself as an attorney. As life progressed, he went back to the church and also became a writer, and joining his contemporaries in the New Thought Movement, such as William Walker Atkinson and Charles Honnell, of both authors, which I do have books here on the channel. If you're interested, just make sure to visit my book playlist. His focus and his teaching was on willpower, on cultivating the will, on ethics, on financial and business success. And by reading the title of this book, we can get an idea that the author wants to invite us into understanding the secret of brain energy and scientific methods and also the importance of the will. One can pick up that this was the dawn of scientific awareness of the exploration of the mind and how each individual can program their own mind for success, whether it's personal or business. What I've come to learn is that those discoveries made several years ago, now here moving into the future and we're working now with so much technology and artificial intelligence, but when it comes down to that basic, what are you doing with your mind? Alia Crump, an assistant professor of psychology and director of the Stanford Mind and Body Lab, stated that our minds aren't passive observers simply perceiving reality as it is. Our minds actually change reality. And that's findings from today's time. In an article, The Best Brain Possible by Debbie Hampton, she goes on to say that at the most basic level, your unique reality is constructed by your unique brain. Making sense of the world and what happens is the result of your individual brain's interpretation of the signals it receives as you go about your days interacting with your environment. So much of what you think of as reality is really a construction of your brain. And so these are the things that we're finding today. And in another article in Psychology Today by Dr. Janice Vilhauer, she pretty much says that we construct our reality based on our belief systems that are ingrained inside our brain. So how we perceive things begin to create itself all around us and the events around us, and we respond to those things. So in, in a sense, we're creating our reality, we're responding with it, we're interacting with it, but it's because of the constructs of our mind. So if you are looking to improve yourself personally, or if you're in looking to improve your business, or if you're an employer or you're an employee, and you're looking to just have an edge, would it not help you if you would find the secret that can hold the key to help mold your mind to even a higher and a greater performance? I believe that if you can get past this author's style of writing, that you will benefit from the secret he is offering. And, and it's in the simplicity of the exercises that he's showing also, but also it's in the determination and the discipline you have and the desire to really improve um, your brain, your life, uh, that you'll find the biggest benefit. But don't take my word for it. I myself, in my simple life, have tried this technique, which isn't new to me, and uh, I could tell you that it has worked for me. But don't take my word. I hope that you can try it and do leave me your comments. But there is a part that you'll be able to catch in the book here where he talks about energy. And it's worth quoting. You'll hear it again later. But it says, your energy is merely the output of yourself in mind. Always to be directed by every ounce of intelligence possessed. I thought that was powerful. And with that, sit back as I turn the page. The Secret of Brain Energy I saw a man at work in a quarry. He thrust the end of a crowbar under a huge rock and threw it into the effort to move the obstacle his utmost strength. 
He had enthusiasm for fierce endeavor. Energy leaped up within him and rushed to the strain of a Hercules. My friend, the railway builder, said to me that the greater the obstacles that confronted him, the more determined he became to overcome them. The one instance illustrates physical energy. The other shows us a psychic or mental energy. The energy of success consists of both phases, together with an unyielding mood of confidence in self, one's effort, and the outcome. It is not merely physical, for Samson was no great success. It is not mental alone, for that may be passive. It is not simply a sense of ability, for that may exhibit in a mild and negative form. But when a man has in him the day after day and year in and year out mood, I can and I will, controlled, restrained, used exactly as he will, yet never surrendering, then he has it, the secret of brain energy. 1. The energy of success is a compound of two general factors a continuance feeling of great confidence and a sense of driving and practical ability. Two, it is not only for everyone to possess this quality, but as well to know that he has it. All persons are endowed with a measure of the quality, at least among average classes, but comparatively few seem to be conscious of its possession. One who flames out in a rage may be aware of his passion, yet totally unconscious of the central energy which has thus become manifest. His consciousness in the case might be called objective. A person may be aware of intense determination to achieve some difficult task, yet give no thought to the focusing energy of his mind. He is aware of a particular fact in experience, but his self-knowledge does not necessarily embrace the inner psychic state. A measure of success worth trying for demands not only that one should possess some energy, but that one should recognize the quality within himself and intelligently control and use it with reference to a goal that is capable of engaging his utmost interest. These considerations suggest the present chapter. Force and Energy 3. Force and energy do not represent the same thing. Modern chemistry and physics make a distinction between the facts and define differently the corresponding words. Force is any agency which can cause a motion, arrest a motion, or change the direction of a motion, while energy expresses in motion or the capacity to become motion. 4. There are two kinds of energy, kinetic or moving energy and potential or energy of position, like the dynamic self and the static. Let us suppose a cannon loaded and ready for discharge. The explosive behind the ball contains molecular energy, capacity for motion, for work. When the charge is fired, The explosive generate gases which are confined but seek to expand in that effort start the ball and the cause of that start is the force of the explosion, while the moving ball represents energy capable of performing work in the moment it is stopped. If the ball is projected perpendicularly into the air, it has the energy of motion, kinetic, until it ceases to mount higher when For a theoretical instant, it has no kinetic energy, as it will in a moment on its descent, but does at that instant of mid-air rest possess potential energy, the energy of position, because it may now fall to the ground from its present height and regain all the energy of motion which it had when it left the gun. Man, a fund of energy. 5. Now, Man is a storehouse of various forces capable of causing the energy of motion. Inasmuch as the forces are, broadly speaking, always discharging and inducing all sorts of motions, 
We may say that man is himself a great unit system of stored energy. Not only does he incessantly release energy, but he also constantly stores up force essential to the required energy of life and action. Taking man as an animal alone, he is more wonderful as a force storing and an energy releasing machine than any mechanism as inventive genius can produce. He is exceedingly complex and he is exceedingly economical in the transformation of his fuel into energy. He may be regarded as a self-contained prime mover, including its furnace, its mechanism of work and energy development, and possessing mechanism for a transformation of power peculiarly and exactly adapted to its purpose. 6. Referring a moment to the teachings of science, it is to be observed that the attractive force which the earth exerts on a body at its surface is called the force of gravity while that which is exerted between two or more molecules of matter is termed chemical affinity. In both cases we have, as Tyndall remarks, working power. That power may exist in the form of motion, or it may exist in the form of force, with distance to act through. The former is dynamic energy, the energy of motion. The latter is potential energy, the energy of position. So then, the cannonball at rest, an instant in air, and the molecule of matter yielding to the pull of some other molecule, and thus capable of exerting that pull because of position, but only capable, as the ball at the highest point of its ascent is only capable, possess potential energy, that of position. 7. Thus in the animal machine also the two forms of energy obtain, and as potential energy is capable of becoming dynamic in motion or action. And as this is simply capacity for work, the body is seen to be capable of working very economically and to an enormous degree. 8. Having in mind the idea of such a machine as was characterized in section 6, Together with differences of mental characteristics, it is evident that for very sort of task there is to be found a kind of man specifically and peculiarly adapted to its successful accomplishment. 9. One of the most important general laws of business energy, then, demands the adjustment of the right kind of man to the right kind of work. In practical application of this law of common sense, the man who works under others should try to put himself where he can do the most work of the highest value. And the man who works over others should see to it that every man under him is placed in a corresponding position of greatest utility. This is the rule for machines. Why not for men? The use of the law is a maker of values. Energy and Health 10. In the operation of the human machine considered as a transformer and user of energy, it is indispensable that the intake should be more than equal at any given time, speaking loosely to the outgo. This is because the man must conduct the preservative and developing operations of body and self in addition to those of his work and the former operations require energy supplies for their own needs. If you constantly release all the normally available energy you possess, you leave for the maintenance of your personal well-being no supply, and the end, sooner or later, is bankruptcy. Brain energy demands health. With some men, and for a time, health seems to take care of itself. But health really does not take care of itself. Right financial returns mean right physical returns in advance. A surplus bank account is never so valuable as a surplus energy account. Business suicide would be a correct characterization of many activities in business and out of it. Can't help it is only another phrase of don't care. 
Many a man says, let her go, meaning himself, when he would better mean the job. It is difficult to understand why business should make one perversely obstinate or obstinately foolish. The science of business is founded on someone's health, that marvelous hard pan of compacted energy. This is not the place for description of health-giving regimes, which are everywhere available, and certain suggestion in which may be found in the author's works, especially in The Culture of Courage. But the consideration of brain energy emphatically calls for the conversation of the businessman's health as the very basis and source of his ability and power. It ought in modern life to be perfectly understood that every physical requirement of common sense means actual financial values. The ethics of business at bottom is the two sides, say, of a $50 gold piece thus inscribed, do thyself no harm and be good to yourself. It may be suggested that you cause these advices to be engraved on the opposite faces of any coin to be carried as a permanent pocket piece and reminder wherever you go. It would give some men a start if they could look attentively at such a talisman when they find themselves in some places or engaged in various injurious practices. 11. For an instinctive treatment of culture of body character, you are referred to power for success, the 25th lesson. In that chapter, the author seeks to rise above the mere level of health regimes to suggestions for the development of the finest instrument of the businessman's work. A body pervaded by the keenest psychic feeling and brought to the most efficient condition. It will serve our present purpose to quote from the lesson mentioned the following, quote, The majority of people seem to be indifferent to the nobility and dignity of the physical life. The present regime does not necessarily imply knowledge of the body's structure, forces, materials, laws, and operations. It does call for a larger, a more elevated thought concerning that wonderful temple, your own body. You are urged to think of its greatness, its usefulness, its divinity, even if not ideal in your case, and to make this thought a permanent factor in consciousness. The purpose will demonstrate itself in interior conditions which must inevitably react beneficially upon your physical nature. Environment exercises incessant and oftentimes an unconscious influence. If it is dirty, disorderly, depressing, unattractive, uninspiring, the effects will first appear in the physical life. Your body responds not only to internal psychic nobility, but also to external uplifting conditions. You should therefore put into your surroundings as far as possible the elements, cleanliness, order, thrift, beauty, all things that appeal attractively to the senses and the white soul. And thus, environing yourself, however, you should not lose sight of the psychic influence sought but should maintain the consciousness. I, the upright self, appreciative of the nobility and usefulness of the physical nature, maintain these surroundings that my life may come to its best and my body may acquire a corresponding character. End of quote. Energy and the Brain 12. Business Energy is not confined to the general structure of the body. The nervous system centers in the brain and the latter organ is a perfectly marvelous engine for the storing and releasing of energy of many varieties. Energy is of course energy, but the energy of the brain exhibits in almost innumerable activities. The structure of the brain, therefore, must be immensely complex with its general protoplasmic substance, its lobes, its convolutions, its nerve fibers, and so on. The complexity of the organ it is that makes possible the enormous accumulation of the mental life. Such accumulations indicate that peculiar grade of energy which we call personal. 
small brain capacity means a comparatively small number of brain cells. Some brains, however, are not developed to anything like their limit. In any brain at birth, there is a given number of cells never exceeded in that brain. Personal development means development of the given brain cells and other nervous matter situated elsewhere, see below, given at birth. Such cells are never created after birth and they are never repaired when injured. A life may signify a limited development of a very limited number of the cells of the brain. Every individual has his limit of power in this respect, but few ever approximate that limit. Or a life may signify a limited or a vast development of considerable number of brain cells. It is the fact that you do not know your limit, either in number or in capacity for development of the cells, that raises for you the privilege, it would seem, the obligation to put forth unceasing effort toward greater mental improvement. But whether or no, we have in the average man's brain a marvelous structure adapted to the storage and the release of energy. Other things being equal, the more abundant and the purer and richer your blood, the greater your brain power, for the brain is like a great sponge loaded with blood. Hence, the importance of health and all the laws that conduce to the best physical tone. 13. In regard to the unknowability of brain limits, it is estimated that there are from 600 million to 1 billion 200 million of nerve cells in the brain for the generation of nerve force, but some hold that the cells merely receive and pass on the force. And the molding, fashioning, and storing up of our ideas, each having a separate existence, but all acting in subordination to the requirements of the organs. They are connected together by probably from 4 billion to 5 billion of fibers, which convey impressions from one another and bring them into combined action. Observe, however, that the nerve cell fibers are as units connected together is not altogether clear indeed is questioned. Nerve action in the brain seeming to be carried on through the surrounding material acting as a conductor between one system of cell and fiber and another system in a way analogous to the conduction of electrical currents. But whether or not this be the case There seems to be in any man's brain all the physical material the utmost diligence for a lifetime might require. If one's mental life is measured by the growth of the greatest number of cells possessed, and if the number that may be developed is so enormous as above indicated, the proposition that no one can know his personal limit becomes evident. It is not because men are not sufficiently endowed that many fail to exhibit great power, but this fact is rather due to the negligence of brain material possessed by all normal people. I do not forget psychic endowment, but still hold that this has no known limit. Mental energy, 14. The releasing of brain energy is accompanied by mental activities as the brain stores nerve energy and as nerve energy accompanies mental activity we may well speak of the store of mental energy which a person possesses. It is always to be understood, of course, that by storing energy, we mean simply securing conditions in which energy may manifest. For we may have seen at the beginning of this chapter that energy expresses in motion or the capacity to become motion, and it is evident that motion or the capacity to become motion cannot be stored in any ordinary sense of the word. The conditions making motion possible may be secured in the brain, and these conditions, together with psychic conditions, may be enlarged in scope. In that sense, one may store mental energy. The phrase is, he has no mental life, he is a person of great energy of mind, show the common recognition of the fact. The meaning is, of course, that one has scanty or large mental ability. Such power exhibits in various ways as in a strong will, a keen insight, ability for intense concentration, an iron faculty, 
a powerful memory, a great imagination. Power of mind means conditions favorable within the brain and self to intense and varied mental activities habituated, but with a considerable action of mental initiative. The only way in which such power can be acquired is through incessant, varied and initiative exercise of the self in large thoughts and affairs. The great businessman is one who, through the making of a great business, has developed his own mental resources and thus secured constant conditions in which mental power may exhibit. 15. When a man hypnotizes himself into believing that he is bound by narrow mental limits, it is even so, for he makes it so. When a man cultivates a healthy, large-sized idea of himself and backs up the motion with intelligent and persistent effort, it then may not be even so to the fullest extent of his idea, but it will be more truly or extensively even so than on any other plan. 16. The amount and quality of your mental power within the unknown limits of some millions of brain cells depends on the amount and quality of mental accumulation. That is to say, the habituated and initiatory conditions favorable to ideas and psychic activity which you make possible by personal development and intelligent reaction with the world in which you live and it will be of immense inspirational and other assistance to you if, along with all your mental activity, you will carry the thought from day to day, asserted throughout your entire personality, from brain to toe and fingertip. Quote, I am bent on the largest and richest mental life, and even now the physical instrument is yielding to this determination. End quote. Thus, you suggest to the brain within the skull and the nervous system, which the self pervades in all nerve regions everywhere in the body, and so to the subconscious self, which resides, God knows where, in the human being, that growth has become the law and must be realized. Use of Energy 17. The outcome of employed energy also depends on the method of its use brain energy develops through psychic activity. But you are not interested in mere power, however great. You desire for business purposes. Your brain energy must come then through the right business use of body and mind. To refer to one phase of matter of use in any mechanism into and through which energy is passing, the less the friction of the parts involved and the more easily the forms which energy takes are changed from one into another, the more effectively does that energy perform its work. All this requires skill of adjustment. In adjustment, we have the first law of the use of the energy of success. 18. Skill is demanded in the control, direction, and employment of brain energy. Some men have the energy of Niagara and the skill of a goat. They can only batter. The result is a jarring conduct of business. I heard a section foreman torturing the air, his nerves, and the bystanders with marvelous profanity. But he did not even disturb his Italian workmen in the least, nor secure more efficient labor. Good business is not a battering ram. Skilled energy is nice adjustment of mechanism, whether human or material, to achievement. An illustration may be seen in differences between two kinds of memory. One man remembers things in pictures, another man of sounds, as we have seen in a previous chapter. Should either try to memorize in the other's way, this would be unskilled use of energy. Or one man must do all things himself, driving those associated with him in the work he simply cannot perform, while another man gets things done by inducing those with him to do everything to the limit and the best without friction. The former has push, the latter skill. Both men may possess equal energy. 19. The difference in value between the two methods is evident. Men who are driven will not, as a general rule, accomplish the greatest amount of the best quality of work. 
men that are induced may accomplish that sort of work depending on the skill employed with the inducement. Skill of use conserves energy and secures best results. Energy is capital. Skill is its investor. Energy is power. Put skill into its direction and it is more and better power. Ignited gunpowder yields force which develops energy in the moving ball. Skill is the inventor and maker of the gun and the gun's mechanism, but the man behind the gun. You can be a mere bullet or a mere gun or a man. If you want to be a mere day laborer, be a bullet. If you want to be a somewhat skilled controller of energy, be a gun. If you want to control energy in the highest manner possible, get behind the gun. This means that you can be a mere implement wielded by some other man, or you can be a trained machine still used by some other person, or you can be the director of tool and mechanism. All depends on your skill in handling yourself and others. The development of such skill requires persistent thought, alertness for opportunity, seizure of the same, the forcing of confidence in yourself, culture of magnetism for control or winning of others, determination to attain the goal, and the study of mental invention and initiative. In other words, the quality set forth in this book. The skill demanded in the development and use of personal energy must be sought, of course, in actual experience. For experience, there is no substitute because it is the application of any teaching to practical affairs that demonstrates the instruction's value and works its principle into the personal life. But every man is a human being to start with and is endowed with more or less of what we call the instinct of human progress. That is to say, we start with the advantages gained by the experiences of our ancestors to a considerable degree and begin life with the ability to do many things without experience in its fullest sense and possess an impulse associated with a measure of power to get on in the world. 20. The man who depends wholly on his own experience and refuses to profit by the experience of others puts himself inevitably in the rear in any undertaking. Why not start with the results of the common experience, relying upon your own as a utilizer and modifier? You are then so much ahead at the beginning of your effort. The age of 50 is always wondering why the age of 20 is so excessively fond of hard knocks. Of course, the age of 20 does not see it that way, but why should not the young man assume that the older person may really know something worthwhile? Take the matter for granted, in a way, or on trial, at least? The curious quality, which I have called megalopsukia, is in evidence when experience which is already established and has learned some important matters remarks, oh, you can't teach him anything, he knows it all. And the shrug of the shoulders indicates the despair of the older man. The cause of many a bankruptcy in business is nothing more nor less than the big head. You must, of course, stand by your own experience, but it would seem to be common sense to give the other man's experience reasonable consideration. The finest of practical instructors is just the compound experience of all other men in business and the man in any particular line of business, yourself. 21. But the development and use of brain energy may also come to involve a valuable skill in the study and practical absorption of the following suggestions. Energy, inherent power. How will you acquire it? How use it in gun or machine or man? The question applies to your body and mind. Answer, by entertaining the idea of energy, by trying to feel it, by assuming that you have it, by acting intelligently on that assumption. Force, power in action. How is again the question? Sell goods, for example, with a club or by magnetic diplomacy. How? Answer. By development of practical ability and magnetic power, by economic use for highest results, by taking yourself in hand, refusing fuss and feathers, unnecessary activity and waste and all nervous excitement, but employing self-possession, nicely adjusting your machine and the energy behind it, to the work to be accomplished. 
firmness, power of grip. The manner in which the grip is taken is important. Grip a man wrongly, you irritate him. Rightly, a personal feeling secures your end. To the question, how, may briefly be answered by cultivating the self-possessed consciousness of a strong yet non-nervous and non-irritating grasp on self, on others, on the situation, holding smoothly but resistlessly to the matter before you. Self-reliance. Assurance of power. Shall the assurance be blazoned forth in gesture and feature, or felt yet masked behind suggestions of the other man's interest? Here again, the word how confronts us. One should assume possession of assurance and confidence and forever try to feel and think, quietly, not obtrusively, that one is equal to the occasion and can surely accomplish the thing in hand. The highest type of power consists of energy employed with skill. Indeed, brain energy lacking in skill is never actual power at all. You will find this important topic of the right handling of self elaborately and practically treated in the volume, Power for Success. The Man and the Business, 22. The best use of brain energy involves the individual and the business. Let us consider both factors simply as individuals. Each is a field of energy. Energy is in each constantly storing and releasing. In each energy is, so to speak, flowing from one place to another, there being not one stream, but all sorts of streams moving back and forth every instant of the day. Now, all this activity within a certain field demands a kind of balance so that always energy is available at any one place for any given requirement. Balance rules the world, says the author of Balance. Balance is the key that unlocks them, the word that explains them, the principle that unifies them. The author, Mr. Smith, employs an illustration which always applies everywhere in the business world. A deficiency in crops is balanced by an excess in prices. An excess in crops is balanced by a deficiency in prices. Other balances, corrective in their nature, rise up also. A deficiency in crops with the corresponding high prices stimulates efforts such as better cultivation and increased planting to overcome the deficiency, while an excess of crops sets forth at work to repress overproduction. The financial world is one vast exhibition of balance, and every detail individual business is an equal illustration. We have, let us say, proprietor, manager, clerks, laborers, errand boys, and so on. Every man, every field of energy must connect in some way with every other man. The sum total of activities must be an equilibrium and a forward movement. That is to say, a good day's work all round means constant give and take, with the least possible friction on the part of all concerned. This double requirement may be expressed in two words, rigidity, yielding. 23. Mind, body, man. On the sea of business is very much like Kipling's steamship, Dumbala, during her first voyage, the ship that found herself. The Dumbala came into a huge storm on her way to New York, and every part of the craft was put to terrific strain. Then ensued a long-continued and lively conversation of complaint, advice, and vituperation, conducted by bolts, plates, uprights, timbers, and so on, to the end of the voyage. Come back, said the deck beam savagely, as the upward heave of the sea made the frames try to open. Come back to your bearings, you slaw-jawed irons. Rigidity! Rigidity, rigidity, thumped the engines. Absolute, unvarying, rigidity, rigidity. You see, whined the rivets in chorus, no two of you will ever pull alike, and, and you blame it all on us. We only know how to go through a plate and bite down on both sides so that it can't and mustn't and shan't move. I've got one fraction of an inch play, at any rate, said the garboard strake triumphantly. So he had, and all the bottom of the ship felt the easier for it. Then we're no good, sobbed the bottom rivets. We were ordered, we were ordered never to give, and we've given. Don't say I told you, whispered the steam consolingly, but you had to give a fraction, and you've given without knowing it. Now, hold on as before. So, in every kind of business, rigidity, 
rigidity is the law of energy, but only part of the whole law, which also embraces give, give, just enough to save friction and hold together. No set of people can work successfully in company without the law in its entirety. In a new business force, the need is apparent. In an old business, if successful, its working is evident. 24. It is precisely so as regards the individual. There are more parts in body, mind, man than in the best steamer afloat. For the brain alone contains millions of cells, and all parts are forever doing things, forever taking up energy and releasing it under the immense strain of forces without and forces within. And so, always, so to speak, are complaining, advising, standing out, combining, soliciting, refusing, vituperating in disease while the long game of give and take goes on. Look out, shout hearts to the legs. You're going too fast and I'll break something. We should say, responds the lungs, already there's a pain here with its warning. Have a care, have a care, the brain telegraphs down to the heart. I'm nearly drowned, too much blood. You're loading me up with too many foolish things, cries the memory. Stand fast there, shouts attention. Don't give. Ease up, ease up, the eyes moan to the will. You'll hurt the optic nerve. Keep at it, keep at it, the will urges mind. But I've got to give a little, replies the mind. Everything is a mere blur now. Rigidity, rigidity, rigidity. Thump the compound engines. Determined persistence. You must all hold on and never let up an instant or everything goes to ruin. Give away a trifle, insists the unconscious self. I want more time for the making of energy and all you parts are throwing it away. Only in such a play of powers by give and take may right balance and adjustment essential to any life success be secured. Energy and success, 25. A businessman, because he is living and a human animal, is a complex system of force, energy, power, of a certain running amount exerted in certain generally established directions and always bent on the work that means success. The success depends on the amount and control of all sorts of energies in the first place, his own, and in the second place, those of others. The control must be managed by effort. Power must handle power if success is to be sure and large. 26. Success may be defined as the crystallization of a certain quality of brain energy. Business success constantly calls for force, energy, power, effort in immense amounts and of precisely the right character. Definitions of these factors tie up into one bundle. Efficiency. 27. The test of success is the amount and kind of effort which a man can voluntarily hold good during a lifetime. The idea may be represented by a line always extending and always straight and of such breadth as to indicate room for energy. The heavy straight line of business energy, however, is ideal and observed in the lives of a few men. The real line varies all the way from heavy to light, from straight to uneven, from constantly extending to some definite limit. And thus we may place side by side the ideal line of lifelong skilled success energy and the curious telltale line of unskilled, broken, and unsuccessful energy. Controlled use of energy, 28. Business education, if really practical, means, for one thing, trained, which is or ought to be controlled energy. It is at this point, frequently, that men fail. It is characteristic of all untrained activity that is diffusive. The boy, when first learning to write, is unable to prevent the simultaneous motion of tongue and legs, which are ludicrously irrelevant to purpose of writing. So, some businessmen can never keep their business to its own kind, but are forever putting effort and time into irrelevant channels. Or they themselves are forever doing unnecessary things within the business in hand. 
the effect of training and attention is more and more to confine the activity to special channels so that the actions themselves are better performed and can be kept up longer without producing fatigue. Whatever amount and kind of energy one possesses, then, we have the following exhortations. Exhortation 1. Eliminate from your life diffusive expenditure of energy. Exhortation 2. Maintain controlled energy and put intelligence into all use of it at all times. The fault of diffusive energy, however, appears not merely in its spreading around, but as well in its failure to pan out anywhere. An inventor may carry on a dozen schemes during a period, yet succeed in some of his efforts because he transfers concentrated energy now to one, now to another. One clerk may be first class for the reason that he is all over the place but doing things of value meanwhile. Another may be equally omnipresent, yet fail because he is never precisely where he is wanted when he is wanted, and is seldom, if ever, ready to do one thing needful without being hunted up and told to do it. Your great businessman may have many irons in the fire, yet he concentrates tremendously on each of them in turn. Robert Houdin, the famous prestidigitator, acquired the ability to keep four balls in the air while reading. Thirty years after, during which period the trick had been neglected, he was able to read while keeping three balls going. His attention, fastened, released, fastened, with lightning rapidity, passing from one thing to another, not consciously, of course, but instinctively, perhaps we should say in the subconscious self, and it thus managed to take precise care of every ball and the printed page. Diffusive energy cannot concentrate. What we may call differential attention has the power to do exactly that. Concentrate because it can instantaneously specialize in a running series of effort. Diffusive energy never heats the iron. Some businessmen succeeded because of many investments, but others fail for precisely that reason. They lack the differential concentration of energy. The difference is largely a matter of energy controlled by trained intelligence. A good corrective rule is this. All attention to all one thing at a time and to all things in due time. The rule has its value for the best handling of a business, but also for the individual himself. In the first place, one must have energetic control of the entire bundle of his personal energies. In the second place, and meanwhile, one must mass his personal energy when required and as required for the best results. It is simply a case of keeping all the balls going while taking full care of each. A man's life is very much like that of a variety of amoeba, a microscopic bit of living protoplasm, looking now like a star, now like an oak leaf, always changing its form, always putting forth arms or feet, pseudopodia or processes, and withdrawing them. As one observes it under the lens, Fine particles are noticed which stream into an arm or foot or process from the whole extent of the tiny animal, the process lengthening and then withdrawing into the body entirely, while another process begins to extend into which the former streaming of the particles now goes on. Our energy must diffuse somewhat, perhaps. A fault allied to that of diffusiveness is seen in wasted energies. Observe a person who constantly performs unnecessary actions. Fingers drumming, face twitching, arms jerking, head turning, and so on. Here is a type of wasted energy occurring in the mental lives of many and no less obtaining in the business world. The waste means wild ventures, poor investments, unsaleable goods, activities and facts of all sorts ending in nothing of value. It also may mean too much energy, quantity beyond the demand in the physical or the business life. Some men are all fuss and feathers. Other men are all slam bang. These people can never nicely gauge requirements. If they drive a nail, they must dent the board. They lift a one pound weight with five pound effort. Their intensity is consuming. They assault a matter of no importance with enormous fierceness. When they criticize, they slaughter. 
They rush at a task with destructive power without knowing the fact they are headlong spendthrifts of value. Remedies for unskilled use of energy. 29. The false application of energy found in poor use is common everywhere. It can be remedied only by patient, persistent attention, experience, and the determination to acquire that skill which makes every effort count. Observe one compositor in a printing office. Every move tells every type is seized as desired, adjusted between the fingers while moving toward the stick, and placed precisely in the right way. Ten or twelve thousand M's a day are to this man not impossible. His neighbor labors furiously eight hours and is content with six thousand M's for his day. He makes three or four motions for every type placed. This difference puts an Atlantic Ocean between millions of neighbors in the business world. 30. Poor use of one's power is often due to scanty attention and fitful concentration. Effort may be adequate when applied, but it is intermittent and is often just short of the required degree of concentration. A blacksmith may heat an iron with a given number of blows of given force, but a blow at long and irregular intervals never beats bar iron greatly, though the force when applied be that of the whole man. It is a curious law of things that they refuse to change in condition unless mind charges into them with continuous intensity of energy. 31. Nevertheless, intelligence is required with the most unrelenting attention. Illustrations are seen in the injunctions. Don't try to sell goods to an angry man. Don't waylay a lawyer when he is rushing to court if you really desire a place in his office. Don't purchase a big stock of silks for a country store, and so on. No sort of human effort demands more downright power of intelligent mind than business. The larger the amount and the finer the quality of actual thought put into any venture in the general run of business, the surer and better the resultant success. All this is commonplace, perhaps, but justified by the fact that business intelligence consists in a mass of truths vitalized by interest and the action of an acute mind. It would be difficult to decide whether thoughtlessness in place or thoughtfulness out of place can be worse for success. It really seems evident that thousands of energetic people are unsuccessful because their efforts are not intelligently controlled and directed. How often it is heard. Why, he's active enough and means well, but he doesn't seem to know anything. The world forgives the born fool because he had to be born, but for no other cause or lack of brain has it the slightest tolerance. Your energy is merely the output of yourself in mind, always to be directed by every ounce of intelligence possessed. The Law of Ideal Energy, 32. By contrast, then, is indicated the ideal energy that is surely prophetic of some satisfactory degree of business success. It is energy concentrated as required by reason of training and mastery, and therefore economical of outlay and seldom running to direct waste, meanwhile steadily pushing on with the utmost skill of brains through the best use of self and others toward the one all-absorbing never forgotten goal, honorable financial success. Training the subconscious self. 33. The personal sphere in which such ideal energy may be developed is the subconscious or, as some writers call it, the unconscious self. This mysterious self we can only know by inference and, of course, understand by it merely a phase of the whole individual. Yet, here is a region which alone seems to explain many actual facts in mental life. The subconscious self is the real creator of the human person and all his energies. Lack of space forbids any extended discussion on this wonderful matter, but the reader who may be interested is referred to further suggestion on the subject to the author's practical psychology. 
that we may forfend, however, against the charge of mere occultism, a few quotations follow, which have the authority of acknowledged thinkers. Thus, Kant remarks, quote, We may become aware indirectly that we have an idea, although we be not directly cognizant of the same. End quote. And Schelling declares, quote, In all even the commonest and most everyday production, there cooperates with the conscious and unconscious activity. End quote. So also Richter held in poetic language that our measurements of the rich territory of the me are far too small or narrow when we omit the immense realm of the unconscious, this real interior Africa in every sense. In every second, only a few illuminated mountaintops of the whole wide globe of memory are turned toward the mind, and all the rest of the world remains in shadow. To the same effect, Wundt states that our mind is so happily designed that it prepares for us the most important foundations of cognition, whilst we have not the slightest apprehension of the modus operandi. This unconscious soul, like a benevolent stranger, works and makes provision for our benefit pouring only the mature fruits in our laps. 34. The suggestion issuing from this general conclusion, then, is that the development of brain energy, among 10,000 other matters, may be confidently given over to the subconscious self, the conscious meanwhile, of course, cooperating by aware feelings of assurance and expectation and action corresponding to the ideal sought. If you want energy, think and feel and act energy until you have it, as you surely will. It may be given as a working method. 35. Here, then, is the real engine room of personal power. You are continually engaged in bringing about these conditions of the personal life in which energy is generated, force exhibited, and power used. But the processes involved go on in a more or less haphazard way, accompanied by much waste and lacking, of course, the most efficient directing. I hold that such processes may be made more intelligent and that personal energy may be generated or brought into the conscious field from without and the subconscious within and used in ways more surely contributory to personal success. Methods for realizing such results will now be given. It being understood that our purpose is suggestive only in order that the reader may receive impulse toward the ideal of self-help and the masterful use of his own unconscious powers. Be ye not faithless, only believe. Here's a perfectly inexhaustible storehouse from which you may draw at will and during life. First Method prevention of waste. This method demands a deliberate, persistent watchfulness, repressing all unnecessary physical action or movements. The rule is now patient and confident practice in detecting such movements and in repressing them whenever discovered. The goal is not merely the elimination of those spontaneous actions listed as undue, winking, twitching, jerking, swinging, snuffing, shrugging, kicking, and so on, which waste, however, are distinctly to be suppressed, but also the most economical use of muscles and organs, eyes, ears, vocal organs, hands, feet, for any given purpose. If you learn to maintain in conscious thought for a time these talismanic ideas, quote, economy of action, precision, effectiveness, end quote. Your subconsciousness will ultimately act habitually on the suggestions given. The method also demands B, economy in the mental life. We all find ourselves frequently working mentally in a perfectly useless way. When this discovery is made, we should bring the processes upstanding with the question, of what possible value can this mental activity be to me or others? And we should then direct the current of thought into some channel worthwhile, or it may be tone down all mental activity for rest. 
patient action of the willpower will accomplish the desired end. Since the self is forever mentally active, the question of energy is one of conservation and direction promising some value to your life. In mental as well as in physical spheres, the words economy of action, precision, effectiveness are suggestive talismans which will finally educate the subconscious self to maintain rather than waste and to use rightly rather than at haphazard the personal energies possessed. Second method, development of the energy sense. We may indicate this method as follows. Disregarding all that may be going on around you, stand erect, breathe deeply and slowly a few times, and summon a sense of great internal energy. This feeling may be described as follows. Suppose yourself about to undertake some great physical feat. You are ready. You are intensely alert. All your powers are subject to instant command. Your feeling of willpower is wrought up to the highest pitch. Your entire attitude says, I can and I will accomplish this one thing. In such a case, your muscles are probably tensed, but the exercise requires that there be no muscle tension whatever. So far as the body is concerned, you are inwardly calm and outwardly motionless, but your whole being is charged with the feeling of mental and physical energy. Observing the conditions, repeat a few times mentally with a sense of intense energy all through the body the words, I can and I will accomplish whatever I undertake. This method should be practiced now and then daily for a long period. Third method, unfoldment of will confidence. We have here, as it were, the core, the pulsing heart of physical and mental energy urging economical and directed use to the greatest success made possible by personal endowments. Every man is possessed of will, but the energetic sense of will is not, in all, consciously present. One may secure the feeling by asserting in regard to self. I will. I am willpower. And in regard to any task, I am equal to this work. I will myself squarely into it. The thing in hand shall be done and well done. The assertion should not be left merely to mental areas in the brain, but should be made with intensity until the whole personality seems to be involved and the feeling of willed energy and energetic willing pervades every part of the body. In time, the subconscious self will permanently assume the attitude indicated. Of course, the value of relaxation and rest must always be regarded. Along with the cultivation of such energy will sense should go effort toward the feeling of confidence. The confidence here suggested is not a merely intellectual belief. It is a profound feeling saturating the entire being. The cultivation of this feeling involves the persistent elimination of doubt and fear, timidity and hesitation by a resolute banishment whenever such enemies come up in mind until not a shred remains. The writer knows that this is no light task, but he also knows after a 10 years fight that the thing can be accomplished. This result, however, is only part of the goal. The more important thing is the will confidence feeling. You are requested to recall how you felt in some experience when you knew you surely could accomplish a task which you did successfully perform. The Count of Monte Cristo, in the work of fiction of that title, when he had escaped from his island prison and stood up 
drenched and alone on the shore which he had gained by a long swim, lifted his hands to heaven and cried, The world is mine. That was the will confidence feeling. Such a compound may be acquired. The process of development demands time, and it may not be altogether easy. But if you will act on the suggestions given, you cannot fail to acquire the value. You should throw into the will energy thought and feeling into these the idea and feeling of confidence in yourself, in nature, in people with whom you deal, that whatever you really undertake is bound to go successfully through. In order to this general mood of confidence, you are invited to affirm frequently every day for months. I have perfect confidence in myself. I am confident. In time, the subconscious self will have no contrary thought. It will have acquired what the psychologists call the set or the bent, the prevailing mood and way of acting essential to success. Thus, you educate the deeper self by means of detailed suggestions. This education may now be broadened and at the same time given a particular general or long-run character by frequently informing the subconscious self, I am sure to succeed in life. I am even now succeeding. I am success. I am. I am power. 36. The above methods refer especially and ostensibly to the individual within himself. The final results would be eminently worth the while if they concerned this only. A happier and stronger personality in a business sense. But the results embrace as well the attitudes and activities of others in relation to yourself and your business. You cannot acquire the traits and powers indicated without favorably affecting and influencing people all about you. Your energy inspires their energy. Your willpower stirs their willpower. Your confidence begets confidence in them. You infect the whole place with the visible evidences of your development. If an employee, you influence your associates and compel the employer to take notice, he will. If an employer, you dynamically charge all your people with an all-round success feeling. These results come about in ways that are on the surface, so to speak. But your endeavor to develop will energy confidence exerts an occult influence as well. You are a power among men. Your personal atmosphere, the sphere of your personality which extends beyond the body and involves surrounding etheric conditions to a varying distance, reveals psychic force which has the character of movements that others will interpret consciously or unconsciously felt as meaning will, energy, confidence. Your attitude of assured success will induce attractive currents unseen, which will, if you are active, intelligent, and persistent, draw men to you, draw trade your way, influence events through natural laws, and bring to you financial resources which would otherwise go elsewhere. Fourth method, psychic inspiration of others. 37. Some people are not susceptible to inspiration to any purpose. When you discover this fact, further effort in their behalf only wastes your own forces. Not often, however, is this discovery made. The majority of those with whom you come in contact can be influenced to energetic activity if you employ the right methods. You must, of course, set the example, for energy cannot make inertia captain. And interest is the inspirer, the director, and the maintainer of life. You must awaken the feeling in others that activity and achievement are worth their while. In the meantime, you can carry the thought about people whom you wish to inspire, that they are charged with energy and are to be practically active in the business. You are yourself poised, controlled, 
always putting achieved things behind you without fuss or flurry. They are to do the same. You are confident that they will do likewise, are now doing likewise. Never mind the facts, stand for the goal. You are employing a method. You do not merely think the matter, however, as it were, in the upper chambers of your mind. You really feel the thought, are assured that it is even as you wish, realize for them energy as moving in every part of their being. It is not simply a mental thought that you are to carry. It is a psychic inspiration that you are to convey to these people, projecting it to them by your steady thought and your perfect assurance. A formula for the process might be as follows. Quote, you are charged, and in brackets, this is to the people whom you wish to inspire, and bracket, with energy which you control and use in the interest of our business. End quote. The affirmation should be repeated and felt wherever you are. If you say no man has time for all this, you miss the method. I am instructing in the building of acquired power, which means a cultivated, habituated attitude of your deeper self in the things in hand, and the present is but a part of the entire system. You can repeat and feel the thought just given in italics until you have developed a psychic habit of feeling precisely that way. When you have so affirmed and felt for a time, a few days, the method being referred to thereafter now and then, you acquire a psychic attitude of such affirmation, such feeling, and you develop an inspirational expectancy that those whom you wish to influence will surely respond to the treatment. Kindly observe, too, that many men have been skeptical about steamers, railways, telephones, wireless telegraphy. You do not know that anything cannot be done until you have thoroughly tried that thing in the right way. End of reading of The Secret of Brain Energy, Scientific Methods in Using Your Powers for Personal and Financial Success by Frank Channing Haddock. The book also included a treatise titled Building a Better Brain by Albert Lewis Pelton, which I've included in a separate video. You can um, jump on it on the link here that will show up or in the description. I've added the link there as well as other resource links that you might want to take some time and peruse through. Before you head out, hit that like button. Make sure you leave a comment, share your thoughts, and we'll meet each other again at somewhere here on this channel at the next video, wherever that might be.